Good afternoon. How is everybody? Good. I'm so excited. I can't hardly stand it. Me. Make sure I've got all this stuff turned off here. Put in that. There we go. All right. What's going on in the world of work? In the real world? I don't know if I have gotten myself back to getting used to getting up in the morning. <laughs> back to work. Drop, not just driving to work, being back to work, getting being on duty, going class to class, everything. It's hard, isn't it? When you get out, it's like it's worse than coming back from summer. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely, yes. yes. It's it's yes. it's worse than that. Yes. I have no sympathy. I've been doing it since August. Sorry. <laughs> our um our school board last night made a decision to get rid of the cohorts for fourth and fifth grade, and they're just all come back on the same day all the time now. So that's been a uh, that's been a fun wrench in our plans this week of trying to make sure we're ready to have all the kids back versus cohorts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all of our turning point, all of our students are coming back in CMS instead of doing the rotations. All of them are supposed to be back all at one time. Yeah. Um, on an unrelated note, Brad, what do you teach for? Do you say you teach on the side for Wake Forest? Yeah, I am teaching their um, elementary uh, science methods course. So it's a lot of fun. It's very hands on. So makes my day happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many? So I'm assuming that they have an elementary ed major. They do. Um, but at Wake Forest, it's it's almost like a double major. So they will get their elementary ed major. Plus, like some are getting it in communication. Some are getting it in counseling. So it's kind of like a double thing for them. That's what I thought. I didn't think they had just a department where you could just go and major in education there. Right. So it's kind of like a, yeah, twofold piece. Yeah, it's a, it's a secondary thing. How many yeah. students do they have? Um, I am not, it's not a ton. Um, like for my methods course, I only have seven students, which is kind of nice because I can get a lot done with seven in a class period. So, um, but I don't think it's more than 30, I think, for the whole cohort piece. Yeah. Well, there would be a limit on how many they could have to do that. They couldn't have more than 30 uh, gotcha. without having a regular program. But, right. I mean, and I think they're just called like a department of education. They're well, not that's like, what I mean. They yeah. would have to be an they would have to go, if they have more than 30, they have to go by the rules as an EPP, an education program provider. Um, gotcha. And I'm quite sure that they're, they're, they, they don't do that. Oh, um, I just learned something tonight <laughs> already. So um, if you're a provider, you have to go by all the rules on student teaching, residency, licensure, all of those things. If you have that, if you have more than 30. Uh, so, um, one, one of the reasons I ask is, is there's a whole new set of regulations coming down on providers for undergraduate that's going to make it just about impossible to stay in the business. Um, and so, yeah. what we're going to see is a rise of more of what you're talking about, that colleges offer it as a, a second major kind of thing, rather than right. being a, what's known as a provider. Um, so. I just wondered what, where they were headed, but yeah, that's why it's small because of that. Well, uh, so uh, Tamarla says that she's teaching on the side as well. Tamarla, what are you teaching on the side? I teach um, IT classes for Southern New Hampshire. Uh huh. And I teach two per term. So I have like 40, probably a little over 40 students. Yeah, they have a, they have a lot in their programs. They've got what, 100,000 students? Yeah, across America, they, that's a that's a big place. Yeah, Got I've been there. Um, yeah. There's a but there's a lot of what I consider to be those alternative things that are popping up all over, and so 
education changes every day, but the law doesn't, fortunately for us. No. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm kind of concerned we don't have very many folks. We normally have a good many more folks in this with us on Wednesday nights, but I guess people might be busy this week. So I'll go ahead and get started, make sure my recording is on. Welcome to Mail 603. Um, this is week seven. So let me share my screen and let's do our housekeeping to start with. Uh, so let's look at our weekly schedule. Yes. Uh, we are in week seven. This is February 24th. Um, you should be uh, to the point of uploading your OMA. Everybody's done very well so far, none sent back. Um, everybody's making three, seven, fives, and fours, which is great. Um, the, doing a, an excellent job on those. And so we're right on track on that. I would encourage you, uh, and Yolanda reminded me of this today, and thank you for Yolanda. You, Sometimes we miss in the process, we miss putting things into Blackboard. Go back and check my grades and make sure that you put everything in to get your points because I'm not going to slow you down. If we can get you to turn it in and get you to task stream, if you didn't bother to upload it in discussion board or the assignment drop box, just make sure that you go back and let me, let me share that with you. Now, you won't be able to see it on mine because I do not have that button. But under my grades, I have the button. My grades will tell you everything um, that you can see. Mine just says it, but you can look under here and see everything that that's, that has to be submitted um, for your grades. So go back and let me see if I click on that button if it'll show it to me. No, I didn't think it would. I'd have to switch to student view. I don't want to go through all of that. But anyway, so but click on. Let's see, yeah. Click on this and it'll tell you everything that, you, that you're responsible for uh, this semester and some of these, especially these OMA things, make sure that you've uploaded all your work in those to get all your points. Um, so just check under my grades uh, and it will remind you if, if you've missed a box or forgot to turn something in because I'm just interested in getting us through the work and getting us to task training. Um, I don't check to see if you've uploaded everything. Um, so just check under my grades and make sure that you've done all that. So Yolanda, again, thank you for that, for reminding me on that one, uh, that we need to check my grades. Um, all right. And so I've got that. Um, I want to do a quick debrief on last week's case study. That was great. Had a lot of your reflections. I enjoyed reading those. Uh, a couple of points to remember from from that last that week. Last, 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 last. Uh, let's see which document this is. Yeah. If you, by extension, fail a kid for the year or exclude a kid for the year for a disciplinary over because of a disciplinary incident, and this was a disciplinary incident, a cheating effect, and you and you put that child out for a year, that's a zero tolerance. Now. There's two different – zero tolerance are defined different ways, and, but it doesn't matter. Um, there's a state definition and a federal definition, but, but the thing for us to understand is assigning a kid a, fa a failing grade for the year without a due process over a disciplinary incident. Again, over a disciplinary incident, if you assign a kid a failing grade for the year – that's against the law. That's a zero tolerance expulsion from school. Again, teachers don't assign grades, principals do, but we can't fail a kid for the year over a disciplinary incident. That's, we would have to go the due process route. And the first thing that we would find in due process is failing for the year is way more, is capricious, is way more punishment than the handbook allows. We would have to go to our handbook and say, is it allowable to fail a kid for the year for a disciplinary infraction? And that would be no. It would stop right there at the first level of due process. Now, let's say if the kid brought a gun to school, that was his. 
and we were going to fail him for the year over that or exclude him for a year. We were going to wreck. We would have to recommend an exclusion, something that's cut and dried as the kid brings a loaded gun to school. We would still have to give him due process. We would still have to go through all of the steps. And in the, in the end, it would be the school board would have to exclude him for the year. And that still could be appealed to court. And it could only be for a year, and then the student would automatically be allowed to read to apply for a readmission and come back. But it would have to go through the principal, the superintendent, the school board before we could even support an exclusion for a year over a loaded handgun, a disciplinary infraction. We would have to go all those steps. And the first thing the principal would have to decide is this an allowable punishment for this infraction? If the answer is no, it stops at the principal level. So when it says in, 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 a, in a policy that says a student may receive a failing grade, it doesn't mean for the year, you have to understand that's not allowable for a disciplinary infraction. It can, it can only mean for that assignment. And then we go to what is the allowable up to one day out of in school suspension. You have to know, it has to trigger in your mind. I have to know that it can't mean by law, it can't mean in a, a, a failing grade for the year. That's, that's not allowable based on, on, on zero tolerance. Now, these can be found inside of that handbook that I've shown you, the disciplinary data reporting manual. That's where this is from. But you have to be able to put that together and, and think down the road here. But part of due process starts at the school level. Again, what's allowable? What's our policy? What is the substantive part of due process? And then was that carried out is the procedural part. And so it failed the litmus test on being capricious, more punishment than was allowable. It also was a violation of state and federal law to fail a kid over a disciplinary incident um, because that's, that falls under the category of a zero tolerance expulsion, which is not allowable. Um, and so we have to know those things. We have to make sure that we can put all these pieces together. And so, that's the debrief on number one part of that, um, is we have to know what the law is. We have to read that manual that it has all of these rules in it that they're all in one handy dandy location for us. That disciplinary data reporting manual has all of these things. And we're gonna to refer to it again tonight for sexual harassment reporting to law enforcement when we talk about those two things in cyberbullying. So, so that's the thing to remember on that one. Now, the other piece is this. I told you, I, I, I am not anti-teacher. I have no malice toward teachers. I'm married to one. I was one. Uh, I still think I am one. That might be debatable. <laughs> but, but I have no malice toward teachers. But the notion that a teacher would fail a kid for the year over a, a disciplinary incident and manipulate the grading scale and that they would not know that, that that's an inappropriate thing to do. Um, mm, that's a hard call for me. Um, and so my, my perspective on that is um, this was not a simple, I didn't, the teacher didn't know the rules or it wasn't about checking the syllabus and those kinds of things. This is one of those one-off situations that you get from time to time where there's, there's malice in, in people's hearts and sometimes they've reached their breaking point. But again, the notion here is this, regardless of whatever's in it, you can't compound that error with another error of your own with this notion that I have to support teachers no matter what they do. You, you have to dissuade yourself from that notion early on or you won't make it as a school administrator. I'm sorry, but that's, I'm, uh, that's just the truth. If you have this notion that I'm gonna be the teacher's champion and that I'm always gonna support them and then I'll call them in privately and, and chew them out over something that they've done, but I'm gonna give them public support or when parents come in and complain, I'm, I'm gonna support them always. If, if you have that, that notion, you won't make it in this business. Now, I'm not telling you that teachers are bad people or that you should throw them under the bus every chance you get. What I'm saying is, is when they've obviously broken state and federal law, you cannot support that in any, and I may be clear, you can't just, you, you can't waffle on that. Well, 
well, maybe we can get away with it or maybe they won't know or, or I'll cover for you. No, you can't cover for them ever, ever in a situation like this. Um, you, you will not survive it. Um, you, your job will, you're, 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 you know, again, it's about your house. You're going to lose your job and your ability to get another job if you do something this bad. You, you cannot break law and, and do those things. Um, uh, when we, next week, when we talk about our case study, unfortunately, I'm going to have a, a relatively recent case from North Carolina where the superintendent ended up losing her job. Um, and again, you, you can't break the law and expect to stay employed. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get there. So that's that's the second takeaway. The first takeaway is you got to know all the rules and how due process works. And the second one is that regardless of how supportive you are of teachers or how you want to be, we, we can't ever, nobody can ever give us permission to break the law. We can't ever support folks who break the law, ever. Um, that, that has to be a constant in, in, in school administration. Um, that can't ever waver. That can't be every now and then when it's convenient. Uh, that, that has to be an everyday thing that, that we don't allow the law to be broken. I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to I'm going to cold call on our two principals to speak to to that notion again. I think it's it's just this important. This is one of those hurdles that we've got to get over in this process to becoming a school administrator. So I am going to stop my share and I'll call on them, Dr. Miraglia. Well, I know I touched on this last week and um, I think you're right. It can't be stressed too much. There, you're going to find yourself in situations where a teacher is going to do something and you cannot defend it. Uh, if you try to, you're just going to end up looking very foolish or worse. And you, it's your responsibility. You've got your first pri priority is making the, I'm sorry, making sure the children can learn that they're safe and that you can facilitate learning in your school. And you have to remember that you're going to be the bottom line no matter what it is. And th the only smart thing to do is to make sure you call someone out when they do something wrong. Dr. Land mentioned last week, he wouldn't keep someone around. Sometimes you can get rid of people, sometimes you can't. But I would absolutely say if you think someone is damaging you, damaging children, you need to talk with someone and see if you can get them out of the building. I did have a situation one time with um, an assistant principal and I did have to talk to my superior about that and we were able to move her. She did not lose her job, but we were able to move her because she was not acting in the best interest of children and you've, you've got to protect your building. Thank you. Dr. Caton. Um, so for me, I agree with you, Dr. Raglia, that um, for me, though, when I, uh, I've been in several situations where, um, you know, the teacher's not correct. Well, not several, I've been in a few. And I often try to spin the conversation where I'm not, you know, blaming the teacher. I don't, I don't do that in front of the, the teacher. I mean, in front of the parents, I always kind of, I always take the fall, you know, I apologize. I'm going to, you know, make this right. I never call that teacher out in front of the parent. I always try to spin it, um, but I, you know, and afterwards the conversation is a more one-on-one -on -one with that teacher. Hey, look, this is what you've done. This is how you messed up, things like that. I always do that. I don't deliberate in front of that parent say, you know, my teacher messed up. She didn't, do, no, I, don't, I don't do it that way. That's just not the way I handle things. Um, but I know for in my county, um, documentation is the key. Um, I've moved on several people to be dismissed, um, but when I do, I have documentation out the wazoo, you know, dates of meetings, what was said, what was done, lots of read receipts of emails, um, specific plans, everything. Um, it just doesn't usually work. I mean, I've had a teacher that I just knew that was going to be um, let go um, that was not on the plan who used a very derogatory term to a student. And she was not let go. Um, she wasn't on a plan is what they said. And I just knew that they would um, release her because it was a very, something that was said that was very derogatory to a specific student. Um, so that's just the way my county is. Um, documentation is the key uh, for anything um, to, when you start to you know, deal with teachers or any type of 
I'm a staff member, so. Yeah, and two, thank you. Two points from what Dr. Caton said to wrap this up. I always assume that there will be a next time. So if you, so even if you don't get the, get the teacher this time, you've got your documentation for next time. And trust me, there will be a next time. That's just the way the world works. You're not going to be lucky enough for this to be a one-off. Um, people don't, you know, as we say, people will tell you who they are. Um, and if you're surprised when they get you the second time, that's on you. What, did, was, what was it that Gomer said? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Or as somebody said recently, you know, the second time the flasher opens his raincoat, he's not wearing a three-piece suit, still naked. Uh, so if you're surprised, um, you know, so uh, Dr. Caton's point is well taken, document. Even if you don't get them this time, maybe you'll get them next time. And then my final thought on this, and we'll, we'll move on from last week and we'll talk about next week. The one thing that I have seen happen countless times that damages a principal just as much or more than, than going along with something illegal, immoral, unethical that a teacher does is to take the tack where you punish the many for the sins of the few. Where you have a teacher who does a one-off thing like this and then you punish the entire faculty. You, you basically accuse them of doing the same kind of thing. Oh, we're all gonna have to go to a workshop or we're all gonna have to go through a training, or we're all gonna have to do this or that, or I get on the, the intercom and I blast everybody. It's kind of like you have one teacher coming in late. Instead of talking to that teacher about coming in late, you you know, you know start you know, with everybody, you put out notices, emails, reminders in the teacher, you know, to come to work on time. Well, I, I, I'm offended if I, if I come to work on time. Why are you grinding on me? Talk to the person that's coming in late. Same kind of thing happens in these instances where, you know, we, we, we publicly support the teacher, but then we grind on everybody else over that teacher's behavior. Um, that's a no-no in our business too. We address incidents as they come up with the people that perpetrate the incidences. We don't, we don't do blanket things where we punish the many for the sins of the few. That's a no-no in our business as well. So that kind of, that kind of, is the debrief on last week. Y'all did a great job on your presentation. Now, I'm gonna say again, I know those nights are long and it's redundant, but there's a, there's a reason why we do them all at the same time because there's always different perspectives, different parts that come up in all these cases. And we wanna give everybody the opportunity to collaborate on these kinds of things. It's good training for down the road when you have unwieldy topics like this that, that different people have different perspectives on. You have to learn but you've got to do the work. And part of the work is making sure that everybody gets a platform to speak um, and that we don't just hear from certain people on certain things, that everybody, and it, I know it's big and unwieldy. I, I freely admit that. And if you want to wear me out over it, go right ahead. But it's good training for down the road when you have collaborative groups and you have different stakeholders with, with different opinions and different perspectives we can't really hammer out those dis those differences and come to consensus unless we can pull the group together. And that's why we do case studies like we do them. There is a, there is a method to the madness. Uh, and you just you need to understand that this is how we just have to do the work sometimes. All right, so let's talk about next week's case study. Next week's case study, so let me share my screen. All right, so next week's case study is, it's, it's fairly short in terms of the reading of the case study, but it's not short in the legal research that you need to do on the Leandro case. The heart of the case next week is, is a principal wants to take and, <clears throat> and vary the funding to different schools, the superintendent does to different schools in their district. Uh, based on equity concerns, you know, at-risk students, high poverty that wants to take and regulate that money. Well, again, as I've told you, you know, full disclosure, I was on the losing side of the Leandro case. Um, and, and that was kind of a, it, it was a problem for me in that 
Um, I was working out of the law center, but I was my my real job was in Charlotte Mecklenburg. Charlotte Mecklenburg was a, one of the defendants in the case. They were one of the high wealth districts. I was working for the side of the low wealth people through the law center um, at Chapel Hill. Um, and so that was a that was an issue at the time. So full disclosure, uh, I, you know, the, the case um, you can click on this link and you'll get the finding what was held in the case. Um, and so make sure that you understand that even though something might appear to be a good idea or a bad idea, it's not it's not the merit of the idea that matters. It's the legality of the idea that matters. Um, you know, the court system in, in America doesn't work like Judge Judy on TV. I've told you, my wife is a Judge Judy junkie. She watches, she records and watches those things. And she asks me a thousand questions and I have to explain to her, honey, that's a TV show. Uh, it has nothing to do with law in, in the real world. Uh, the notion on Judge Judy, and she says it all the time, if it makes sense, it has to be true. If it doesn't make sense, it can't be true. Neither of those is correct. That uh, it makes sense to some people to give the, the less fortunate more, or, or it, you know, it doesn't make sense to everybody. And so the notion here is, what does the law say about doing that? Um, and so, you know, could we could we move local money? Could we move federal money? Could we move state money? Could we move any or all of those monies to those schools? to differentiate between them. Now, some people will say, that's a wonderful idea. Other people will say, no, my kid's over here at the school is gonna get his resources taken. There's gonna be stakeholders on either side of this argument and they're gonna have valid points, but your job is to determine what does the law say? Not what you feel or what you think. Um, it, it's You can't be Judge Judy now because I think it ought to be this way, it, it'll be this way. No, you have to follow the law remembering that Judge Judy is just a TV show um, and and has no, no basis in reality or in law. And so what that does is you have to dissuade yourself from the notion that if it makes sense to me, that it, it must be the right thing to do. Either way that you fall on the argument of, of, of moving the resources around. You, you're, you're allowed to have an opinion, but that, that opinion has no merit in court. What I need for you to do is make sure that you understand that before you enter into this case study, that what you think is unimportant to the resolution of this case study. What's important is, is that you've done the research and you know what, what Leandro is about and that you know what the, the legal decision is on moving funds in schools, local, state, or federal, what, what that is. Now, the Leandro case is a state case. You say, well, it doesn't speak to local or federal. Well, of course it does. We know that schools are funded three ways, local funding, state funding, federal funding. But what happens is, is when we start moving money around from one to the other, it affects the other two. You can't just move state funds that not affect local or vice versa. So understand that the Leandro case is about state funds, but it, but it has implications for local and federal funds as well. Uh, and so whatever the decision is on whether state funds can be moved that way, that, that, that decision would hold for local and federal funds. And we'll talk more about that next week in, inside of the case, uh, especially on local funds. But we'll, we'll talk about that. So make sure you understand that um, that while, hold oh, one second, I'm in class now. Nope. Okay. All right. And so regardless of, of your notion on this, do the work, make sure you understand. And again, it doesn't require your agreement. Uh, and, you know, and you can follow up on the, you know, Leandro has been in court even as, as late as three months ago. Uh, it continues to be the gift that keeps on giving. But make sure that you know um, that this is about the law and not about opinion or what you think is, is just or right or 
those kinds of things. All right, so that, that's enough on, on Leandro. That should set us up. So remembering that you will present your, your Leandro next week, looking back at our, at this. Next week, you'll present the Leandro in, on school funding. And then the next week, we'll have a break. Um, and then we'll come back on uh, March 17th and we'll hit EC. Um, there's been some, some further developments um, that Dr. Miraglia is going to talk to us about when we get to that one about MTSS and intervention teams. Some, some information that has come down the pipe just this week on that one um, that follows along with, with our lesson on that, um, that intervention teams are school-based committees and you've got to be in charge of them as principal. Uh, we'll talk about that. Then staff, HR, um, case study three coming up. And then after our Easter break, when we come back on the 14th, We'll have a treat. Dr. Caton and Dr. Miraglia will, will, will lead class that night. And then we'll do finance and our last case study. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get deeper into sexual harassment and those things that even though we're mentioning it tonight, we'll do a final on that one. So that's, that's where we are. We're approaching midterm. I would encourage you to check my grades again to make sure that you've been that you're keeping on pace, that you're putting the things in uh, that the work that you're doing, that you're putting in all the appropriate drop boxes to make sure you get your scores. Um, now would be the time to start looking at that as as next week's class is at our last one before midterm. So, so if you have any questions on that, please let me know. All right, so I'm looking at our time. We're right on our 30 minute mark, We're right where we need to be. So I wanna talk now about cyberbullying. That was this week's, um, was to look at that. Now, there is the cyberbullying statute is in that handy dandy manual again. Um, and I wanna pull it out and look at it specifically. Um, so we have to report bullying. Uh, to the state, um, and we have to report cyberbullying, um, and we have to, um, there is a state statute on bullying, so it is uh, a violation of the law. Um, bullying takes on many forms. We're going to talk about bullying more specifically and, and sexual harassment when we get to the, to the end. Tonight, we're just, we're just going to talk about cyberbullying for a couple of minutes. I'm going to relate a couple of stories. Uh, Dr. Caton may have one. Dr. Miraglia, I know, has one. And so the notion here on cyberbullying is this. The cyberbullying law was not struck down. Principals will tell you that. I didn't do anything about that. I can't do anything about that. The cyberbullying law was not struck to the statute. The only thing that changed on cyberbullying when it was revisited in, in, on appeal in court was the, the, the section that addressed Twitter wars uh, was, was addressed and, and thrown out. So what that means is this, like I've mentioned this before, Megan and I are in a Twitter war um, and she, you know, and she's, she's willing to go 100%. Um, and she goes and, and, and all of a sudden, I think she's gone too far uh, in our Twitter war. We're, we're back and forth. And I've been engaging in this Twitter war with Megan. And now she has just, she's just scorched me. She set me on fire. And now I'm mad. And so I claim that she's bullying me. She's cyberbullying me. Well, that part of the cyberbullying law was, was struck down, was taken out. If you willfully engage in a social media battle with somebody, you're, you're in a, a Twitter war with somebody and, and, and you feel like they've gone too far, you can't claim that you're a victim because you willingly engaged in that, even if they did go too far. If, if, you, if you entered into it with them. Now, if they just post something on Twitter bullying you, that's different. But if you're engaged in a back and forth and then she, you know, tells the truth about you and you're offended, like would be in my case, um, you know, he's an old blowhard. Well, you know, I, I, I fully I fully deserve that because I engaged with her. Now, if she just went to Twitter to, to post that, that would be a different story. That's the only part of cyberbullying that has changed. The rest of the pieces are still there. Um, you know, you, you, 
can't engage in, in bullying online, in cyberbullying. But that part didn't change. Now, and so um, the, the, the other piece of that legislation that people are confused about is this notion that we have to prove that they used one of the school's machines to do it or that they were on their phone on campus when they sent the offending text or instant IM or Facebook post or Twitter post or whatever. So what you have to understand about cyberbullying is it doesn't matter where it happened or what machine you use. If it disrupts school, um, then then um, then you have to take you you have to deal with it. It is an infraction, and you're going to have parents who come in. That's going to be their argument. You can't prove that, that he sent that text from school. I don't have to. He sent the text, didn't he? You just admitted that he did. Well, that that's all I have to. It, did did he did he send it or not? If he sent it, it doesn't matter where he sent it from, what machine he used. And so I, I've seen school administrators kind of duck this one by saying, well, we, we can't prove where it happened. It, that's not what the law says. The law says if it disrupts the, the normal operations of school, you got to deal with it. And now the, the third piece that people misunderstand. And this one goes to my story. Cyberbullying is a crime. You need to involve law enforcement. Uh, and if they decide not to follow through with it, and it, and it says so, if they, you know, in, in the reporting manual, if, if they decide not to pursue it, fine. You don't have to report it as reported to law enforcement, but you need to give them the opportunity, especially if it's of a sexual nature. One of the things that we're going to talk about when we get to sexual harassment is, you know, is that you are not qualified as a school administrator to do an investigation of sexual harassment or of a, of a sexual crime. Harassment is a crime, by the way. You are not you are not qualified to do that. And so if somebody comes in and says, I've been touched appropriately, I've been raped, I've been I've been assaulted in some way, your first response is to get to your school, is get to the police, your school resource officer, or them. Many districts if, if they have their own police force, if not the local police force has a sex crime investigator. You know, for years, I don't know who does it now, but uh, Kenny Lynch and Annie Ka Angie Cathcart did it in CMS forever. That, that's who did, did, did those investigations. School administrators, that's, you are not law enforcement. You are not, because it's a crime, you are, and it's of a sexual nature, you are not qualified to do those investigations. Uh, especially e even if it, even if it's some kind of a, you know, e even, even if it started out as online or it may lead somewhere else. And so cyberbullying, many, so Dale, how are you drawing this? Many times cyberbullying and what happens online can lead to sexual infractions, sexual crimes. And so that's my, my example, my first example. For the evening. Um, somebody saw a, a, a phone that a young person had at, at Huff High School. Uh, and they saw an image on the phone and they realized, oh, that's an inappropriate image for a phone, um, was a partially or new middle school girl, looked look to be 12, 13, 14 years old. And they reported it to school officials. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that, I, I'm not going to claim any, any, any credit in this one, but an AP that I, that I had trained and I'll say that for the reasons that he knew the law, immediately got in touch with the school resource officer at the school and the school resource officer went and confiscated the phone and was able to obtain a search warrant to search the phone that you couldn't have done as a, as a private individual or as a school administrator and come to find out um, he was involved in some cyber bullying of these girls to send these, these pictures. And then when he got the pictures, he was using them to blackmail them to have um, to, to, to have sexual relationship with underage girls. He was 18 years old. And it was quite a quite an ordeal in the community. The press was just, uh, but they did the right thing. The young man ended up, he's still in jail because um, he was 18 years old. But 
sometimes what starts out as cyberbullying can turn into real bullying or sexual assault offense, those kinds of things. You never know what's going on. You certainly don't want to ignore cyberbullying and somebody commits suicide. Unfortunately, that happens and we all know it does. You need to get cyberbullying may just turn out to be a Twitter war. Okay, then the police won't, won't, won't do any charges and you don't have to put it down that you report it to law enforcement. You just put down cyberbullying and, and you go on about your business. But unfortunately, we can't depend upon it to be something that simple. We just can't. And so I would recommend that in cases of cyberbullying, you involve your, your law enforcement. If, if they decline to get in, you know, to go any further than what they initially see, that's okay. But if, if, you, if you don't, and it turns out to be a whole lot worse than you thought it was, that's gonna come back and reside with you. So for cyberbullying, where it happened, what machine was used is inappropriate. You're correct that if you're in a Twitter war and you start losing, that's not cyberbullying, but that's the only part of the statute that was struck down. And if, if you're involved, if there's a case of cyberbullying, I would involve police. I wouldn't call 911, but I would involve the police and let them get involved. Um, and so, because they have great, much greater powers of search than you have, and they have the power of subpoena and search warrants. Um, that, you know, they can go to phone companies and get records that you can't and those kinds of things when students conveniently lose their phone or try to delete their accounts, those things can be recovered by the police. You want to make sure that you have covered all of your bases in that. I will stop now. Uh, Dr. Caton, do you have something that you'd like to add to that? Uh, I was just going to say, um, I've been doing this 22 years and I personally have not had a true cyberbullying case. I've had a lot to come to me and parents, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? And, and I will be honest with you, I hate social media. Uh, for myself, it's fine because I know how to use it, but these students, they don't know how to use it. And it spills over big time into the school, you know, resulting in drama, possible fights, you know, all that. And you spend half your day week, or days um, you know, researching, looking at this video, that video, and it's a lot. It's very, you know, it's very time consuming. And then you find out, like uh, Dr. Lamb said, is that it, it's a two way street there. And, it, you know, it's, and parents don't like that. They don't like that at all. Right. They, you know, say to them, here, was this what your daughter did or your son did? They don't like that at all. Um, and, you know, I, I have, you know, had um, cases where um, I've seen students, you know, um, brandishing guns. Um, on social media, um, and I've had to deal with that, um, and I did, um, but I've not had a true cyberbullying. More, it's more or less they're back and forth, and one finally can't handle it because they're scared they're going to get in a fight. Yeah, and so that that part of the statute was struck down is actually good for schools, and, and Dr. Caton just highlighted that. We don't have to go running down every little, you know, spat that they have on social media. Um, and so that, that's true, but you've got to investigate enough to find out that this is a back and forth. If you find out this is not a back and forth, you, you need to proceed on. That's exactly right. And so so you can't ignore it. It is very time consuming. It is. It sucks. <laughs> but the, the, but the, the takeaway is, is that you got to take them seriously and investigate every one of them. And, and it's, but as soon as you find out it's just simply a Twitter war that I couldn't handle anymore, then you can move on because that part of the statute was taken out. Actually, the school people are the people who complained about that, and that's when it was struck down, that, that piece have, of the law. But you still have to handle, because are they possibly now going to fight in your building? And exactly. You all that mess. Yep. And, yeah. yeah, and the very... Now, when I taught this course in the fall, I taught the doctoral level of this course for the EDC, EDCI doctoral. But then the semester before, when I taught this course, in this format for add-on licensure. Um, my two coaches, one of them, um, unfortunately at her school, um, there had been a Twitter war going back and forth and it was it gotten pretty intense into what Dr. Caton just said. Kid was waiting at the bus, at, waiting at where the buses unloaded at the school on the bus lot, didn't say a word. And as soon as the kid got, the kid got off, he, he beat the tar out of him right there on the sidewalk in the bus lot. 
which caused a, a major ordeal and more people jumped in. And so, you know, you, you need you need to, even though it might not violate the cyberbullying law, you still have to deal. You got to do the, you got to do your your investigation, but you got to deal with stopping the, the fallout from that. Now that one party is agreed, you still have to do that. But the bigger, the overarching is you can't, you can't, you can't fall back on that cop out. I, I can't prove it happened here. I don't have to deal with it. You, you have to deal with it. That is not, that is not the law. There are people who will argue, well, cyberbullying was struck down. I don't know that they, they, they they're using that as a cop out, and you know it's it's all about probability. Now I was able, it'll get you. Now I was able to uh, remove a teacher um, because they got into a Facebook war with a student and called the student like a dumbass <laughs> and things like that. So I was able to remove that teacher. <laughs> yeah, these are things you can't make up. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. We got. They want to. <coughs> Don't want to say that it's freedom of speech well you're still representing the school system that's no. what they forget and so and that's part of cyberbullying as well i'm sure dr miraglio will remember the very first case that we had back in the day in cms there were four teachers that had taken to facebook to write very derogatory and racist and discriminatory things about their own students uh and then claimed First Amendment, <laughs> but you know the people that were in the unemployment line with them, you know, didn't want to hear that. Uh, they were there for legitimate reasons, and so all four of those were, of course, let go. Um, and so that's part of this cyberbullying as well. Uh, it, it's not it's not confined only um, to, to, to students. Sometimes teachers engage in it, but sometimes teachers engage it, engage in it, especially younger teachers in their private lives as well. They bring it all to your doorstep. You must deal with it. Again, to be redundant for the seventh time tonight, the law was not struck down it, that you don't know where it happened or it didn't happen at the school in terms of where these texts or, or Facebook posts were generated. We don't have to prove that they were sitting, the teachers were sitting in their room facing on face, posting on Facebook. We don't have to prove that to take action. Uh, and so that, that, you know, your get out of jail free card there, you lost it. You got to deal with it. All right, Dr. Miraglia. My two situations are not necessarily about cyber bullying, but it is the inappropriate use of social media and how it does fall into your lap um, when, when you're a school administrator. One situation is similar to what Dr. Caton just mentioned. We had a student last year who, before a school event in the evening, posted on social media um, some pictures of guns. And this did happen after the school day was over, but it didn't matter. We were still responsible for looking into this matter. Law enforcement got involved. He ended up going to an alternative school for a period of time. So even though it did not happen on campus, it was still our responsibility. And that's what you've got to remember. Any of this stuff can impact your instructional day and can impact the safety in your building and you have to handle it. A little bit of a different situation that we dealt with, and this was a first for me. I was um, working in my office last year and the secretary said that there was an FBI agent at the school there to talk with me. I'm generally a law abiding person and it was a little bit, I was taken aback to hear that. I've never spoken with an FBI agent before. And talking about how they have the ability to trace things and you've got to get law enforcement involved, their terrorist group had been um, monitoring different things that had been posted on social media. And we had an eighth grade girl who was posting stories on a particular social media site that were about school killings, shootings, and other forms of violence against, and, and she had created a character and different things like that, but we still had to get involved with that, and that got into a very serious situation, and unfortunately, I'm the one who had to start monitoring her writings because she was directed by law enforcement to cease, and she didn't, so um, that was a little terrifying to see into her dark mind, 
but even something like that can come and hit you out of the blue, but you still have to be involved and work along with law enforcement to try to handle these situations and to make sure it doesn't spill over into your day. And she had shared some of her work with other students um, and it wasn't reported to us by them, but we started finding out that they were, had been exposed to what she had been sharing on social media. So that was a very unusual situation that I had never experienced before, but you never know. I have a teacher that tells me all the time, you need to write a book because nobody would ever believe all this mm -hmm. stuff. That, that pops up, thank you. Um, but uh, two takeaways from, from, from Dr. Miraglia. You need to have a good working relationship with, your, with law enforcement. You can't be an adversarial. It can't always, the door can, it can't swing just one way. That they're only there to bail you out and then you're able to throw them under the bus when, when it suits your purposes. You need to have a working relationship with them. And that's why I said, Everything that comes across your desk, that cyberbullying, bullying, sexual assault, sexual harassment, you need, you need to consult with them. And if, they, and if they pass on it, that's fine. But the, the, the last thing you want is for, your, is for them to be the last to know that something went on and then they have to get called in front of their supervisor when it hits the news that they didn't know what was going on or they, you know, they weren't involved. Um, they can't be the proverbial last to know. They need to be the first to know. And, and a lot of times they'll say, no, this is, this is you, uh, and, and they'll move on. But you need, to have that, you need to have that courtesy, that working relationship, that respect. With your, that they're not going to take up things just because you tell them to. That, they don't work for you. They're, they're only going to pursue things that are actual violations of the law. But you need to let them be involved and you need to let them make those decisions up front. And, and I have people all the time, yeah, but, but it'll, be, it'll be bad PR for the school. It, well, but it won't be near as bad as when it comes to find out you didn't, you didn't handle it. You, you know, you'll be accused of covering it up. That's a whole lot worse than the crime. As we know, the cover-ups always is, is bad. Or, for you, the cover-up is much worse than the crime. Um, and so you need to have a working relationship with law enforcement. My quick story is treasury agents showed up when I was a high school principal. And I thought, why in the world would treasury agents show up at a high school? But I didn't know at the time, but I do now, that the Secret Service is the division of the treasury, treasury department. Um, I should have paid more attention to civics, I guess, uh, in high school. And so two Secret Service agents who were a department of treasury agents showed up. Uh, during the Clinton administration, I was high school principal during the Clinton administration. Yeah, that makes me old. And um, one of our students had used a school computer in the, in the early ages of, you know, when, when you didn't have email other than, than and computers other than in schools, and had used one of our computers to send a death threat to the first lady, Hillary Clinton, threatening to kill her, to assassinate her. Um, and so, um, you know, the people that work for Treasury Secret Service, they don't have any sense of humor over stuff like that. Uh, they didn't crack a smile. Some of my best material went right over their head. They were not pleased. Um, they, they were not happy. Um, and so, you know, we worked with them to a resolution of that problem. But it can be something that serious and that, that, be, that on the national level down to something like a Twitter war. And, and that's the parameters. And I told that story to define the parameters for you. There's nothing too small to deal with. Uh, it can be anywhere from that to a, an absolute death threat to the first lady of the United States of America. Anywhere in between, you got to deal with it. Doesn't matter. There's there's nothing too small. There's nothing too big. You know, you consult with law enforcement. Get get involved in that and and everything, and and you, and you will survive it. If you don't, you won't. It, it will it, it it will not go well for you. Um, sexual harassment. I've got a, a presentation in there tonight. Let me share my screen on, on these things, these, these major infractions in school. Um, let me pull that up so you can see it. Um, decreasing violent acts right here. These are kind of the, the poison tree that all the fruit, the fruit falls from. Cyberbullying and bullying, sexual harassment, sexting, gang activity is, these are the causes of the, 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 the most frequent causes of violent offenses on your campus. 
They don't start out as violent offenses, but that's where they end up. And so I've got a whole, I've got a whole slideshow here that I did in 2011 for the, the, the NCDPI's conference. I don't know why they thought I was an expert, but anyway, so here it is. This is the one I did for them for the big annual conference, DPI, Safe Schools or whatever it's called, Helpful Living. So here, here it is. And, and so again, you see these things right here. These, these, these are the four things that we've identified through data that lead to most violent offenses on campus right here. So if you don't deal with them, you know, it's, it's it, under the, the law of antecedent behaviors, the little things become the big thing. So I can't stress enough how important it is for you to deal with these things. And to Dr. Miraglia's point, if you get over on the back side of this, Let me get this out of the way so I can see it and you can see it. These images here were captured off of social media, by the way, um, to what she's talking about. So you, you better you better be watching and you better be taking and you better take it serious. Um, because these people are generally over here in the gang member, hardcore gang member. When you see this kind of stuff, and violent things will happen at your school. These are actual pictures of actual students of ours that we had to deal with. Um, there's other signs and symbols as well. Um, we've got, you know, you'll see here, these things were confiscated off of students at school, watched the graffiti, uh, ta excuse me, uh, I clicked on the wrong button there, tattoos, um, Bonus question here. Can anybody figure out why why the way this young lady's fingernails are painted, why that's a gang symbol? Anybody smart enough to catch that one? Blue and white, one, two, one, one, two, three. So that symbolizes 13. Um, blue is... Uh, that's Sir 13, that's, there, there's his blue, not MS, there, that's Sir 13. Um, so that, that's, um, th that was a good catch by the, the administrator that caught that one. But there, there they are. So um, there's a reason why behind, other than just, you know, general aggravation, um, th there's a reason why that we have to pursue texting, sexting, sexual harassment, bullying, cyberbullying, um, and then gang gang activity. A lot, some of it is related, to it, and even if it isn't related to gang activity, those things lead to the most violent offenses in your building. Just like the, the principal I was talking about last summer that worked with me had a student assaulted badly on a violent a violent attack based over a cyberbullying incident, a, a social media incident. And that's the kind of stuff that happens. Kids are afraid; they bring guns. How many times have we heard that story in schools? The reason I brought this gun because I was afraid. They were bullying me on social media, Facebook posts, those kinds of things. I felt unsafe, I brought a gun. I attacked that person, I did this, I did that, I did the other. Um, weapons, those kinds of things, those violent offenses stem out of bullying, cyberbullying, sexting, texting, those kinds of things. Sexual assault, harassment, um, the, the indecent liberties with a minor came out of, started out as send me a pic, send me a naked pic. Uh, I'm going to post this on social media. If you don't have sex with me, the 13 year old girls from an 18 year old boy, the, all this stuff goes back. It has a genesis when, and we know what that is. And so that covers tonight's lesson. I should have five minutes left. Let's see, I've got three. Moving into your skip going forward, I've already covered the skip. You've got your task and your prompts. Um, you should be working on skip task one right now. If you make sure you're wrapping up your OMA, I'm so pleased with your discussion board posts are great. You're searching your answers. You're being thoughtful. Your case study last week was great. Be that thoughtful in your research for the case study next week. We'll go faster. 
Uh, even though it's a highly complex, we'll, we'll, we'll get better as we go. Everybody be prepared to go and we'll go in reverse order that we went last week. Be ready to do that. If you have questions about the skip, do not hesitate to call or, or look at the materials I've got for you. Don't hesitate to call or email me if you're having problems with that. So that's the last thing. We got two minutes left. Uh, I will we'll leave it up. Does anybody have anything for the good of the group? And not, I will allow our two principals to do their final thoughts for the evening. All right, Dr. Caton, lead us off. Your final thoughts for the evening. Um, oh, whew, well, that's a lot to talk about. Um, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. You'll see a lot of stuff. <laughs> and like uh, Dr. Lamb said, um, act upon it. Take everything serious. Document. That's about all I got for right now. You talked about so much tonight. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's it's it, there is a lot there. It, there is a lot, but it's it all falls under the category. It's not serious until it is, and and it's how you've dealt with it all along that matters. Doctor Miragna, close us out for the evening. You know, we started off talking about situations where maybe teachers were not doing what they are supposed to do, and we have said we don't ever intend to throw teachers under the bus, but we do have those situations. Well, on the flip side. We also have administrators who don't always do what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I feel that anything with social media, whether it's bullying or anything with social media, it can be very tempting to just let that go. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it didn't happen on campus or, you know, it's, it's not anything that I need to be concerned about. Do not fall into that trap because it will absolutely come back and bite you. And you are the one who will be bitten. So mm -hmm. that's one of those things where, you know, people don't like it when you call them out that they're doing something wrong. If administrators are not investigating situations like that, and it does take a lot of your time, it's gotten worse and worse as, as I've seen over the years, but you've got to do it. Or at some point you're going to be, someone's going to be asking you, why didn't you investigate that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because our in, in the end, our job is to protect. We're there for the children and to make sure that they, they're able to, to learn in a safe and, and helpful environment. All right. I'm, I can't wait till next week for case study two. Y'all work hard. Y'all, I know you'll do a good job. I'll see you all again next Wednesday. Everybody be safe. Bye-bye.